This week we talk OS X security with Patrick Wardle. The vintage bearded man Jack Daniel is back in studio. And stories of the week include topics such as bug bounty bro- programs. Are they worth it? The latest big Apple security bug and hacking LastPass. All that and more, so stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild. Packets aren't the only things getting sniffed and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. This episode is sponsored by NetSparker, the developers of the only false positive free web application security scanners, enabling you to automatically identify vulnerabilities and security flaws in all your websites, web applications, and web services. NetSparker scanners are available in two editions, NetSparker Desktop and NetSparker Cloud, the enterprise-level online scanning service. For more information, visit their website on netsparker.com forward slash security weekly. And by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean and mean pen testing machine. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. And by Onapsis. The leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them online and on the web at anapsis.com. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. Something about glitter. I don't know. We didn't update that part in the show notes, so I have nothing to read, so therefore I'm lost now. But anyway, welcome to Security Weekly. I'm Paul Asadorian. As always, excited to be here. I've got all keyboards and cocktails. Thank you to Mr. Jack Daniel, who's over at the bar here in studio, mixing up the cocktails. Oh, that sounds wonderful, Jack. Jack, what is it we're making uh, this evening? That is a rum old-fashioned using Mount Gay... Uh, eclipse rum, little uh, little bit of uh, organic uh, sugar, and a um, uh, little of this, a little of that, some Aztec chocolate bitters, you know, just, oh, yeah, just the, the usual. The <clears throat> yes, it's fantastic. Thank you very much, Jack. Jack will be joining me here on set shortly. I want to introduce our remote hosts who are missing out on all the cocktail activities. Mr. Joff Dyer is on the lines via Skype. Welcome, Joff. Sorry, I'm missing the remote uh, cocktail. Wait, wait, that didn't sound right. Sorry, I'm missing the localized cocktail activity. <laughs> yes, it's localized <laughs> oh, cocktail activity. Always sorry, but it's good to be here. Mr. Not Kevin's on the lines via Skype as well. Welcome, Not Kevin. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Good to see you. Yeah, I get so excited when I say Not Kevin because I, I, <laughs> I love Not Kevin from off the hook, and now he's here with us on this show. It's, it's so exciting not kevin uh it's an honor thank you uh, well the honor is all ours um, well i did, made, you, I, you, I have a story you, or two in there that will probably uh pique your interest so i'm excited it has to do with the license plate uh ordeal I, going on i had a feeling you yes, were gonna you were i'm gonna going that. there oh, we're gonna go there don't worry <laughs> uh before we go there uh, i want to talk about a couple a quick announcement ready to learn combat firmware analysis Sign up for my Black Hat course, Embedded Device Security Assessments for the Rest of Us, a two-day course hosted at Black Hat Las Vegas. Registration includes breakfast, lunch, access to Black Hat briefings, business hall, sponsor workshops, sponsor sessions, and arsenal talks. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash IOT to register today. like to welcome our special guest, Patrick Wardle. Do I say that right? I feel weird when I say your last name, Patrick, for some reason. It just feels strange. Like, strange things. Well, anyway, Patrick is the director of research at SYNAC, where he leads cyber and research and development efforts. Having worked at NASA, the NSA, and vulnerability research labs, he is intimately familiar with aliens, spies, and talking nerdy. Currently, Patrick's fo- focus is on automated vulnerability discovery and emerging threats of OS X and mobile malware. Patrick, welcome to the show. Thanks, Paul. Great to be uh, part of part of the show today. Yeah, I'm glad you could join us this evening. Patrick, start by telling us how you got your start in information security. Yeah, I guess uh, kind of uh, in university I studied computer science and um, enjoyed aspects of it, but I never saw myself as a, you know, a programmer developing enterprise software. That just seemed 
horrible to me. Uh, so I kind of got more interested in the security components. Uh, I then did an internship at NSA where I got exposed to um, cybersecurity threats. Uh, I did a tour uh, in the init- uh, malicious analysis branch where we looked at malware that was infecting um, DOD systems. So that was really kind of interesting. And to me, that really piqued my interest because you know, you're going up against the best bad guys and it's a cat and mouse game. It's a puzzle. It's always changing. Um, so definitely a really interesting thing. So that's where I got hooked. And from then on, it's just been uh, kind of more of the same. And then, so from there, did you go to uh, NASA? Uh, no, so I actually worked uh, at NASA uh, while uh, in, in college. I worked uh, in California at the Ames uh, Moffett, Moffett Field, uh, working on software for some of the space shuttles, uh, which was really cool. I was definitely the dumbest person there. Um, I mean, everyone else was like legitimate rocket scientist, <laughs> scientists. <laughs> um, like, so I did. I, yeah. was, I was doing an internship with NASA in conjunction, and then when I graduated, um, I took a full time job at the NSA. Excellent. Um, in, so, uh, when did you start to focus on um, Mac OS X security? Um, so, I did some research on OS X, um, kind of uh, back in the day. And then, most recently, when I got to uh, Synac and I started to do more uh, defensive analysis, uh, then I really, um, you know, that really piqued my interest. And uh, I saw it just as um, an emerging field that I felt wasn't being given enough, you know, enough of an overview by researchers. Um, you know, I'm a Mac user. I love my Apple products. I have definitely drank the Apple juice. Um, so I like that <laughs> Apple juice. <laughs> <laughs> my wife, it's her, you know, give her credit for that. Um, so, you know, I, I have just con- been concerned that my personal computers and devices may be not as secure as, as they could be. So that really kind of drives my passion there. So in terms of Apple devices, <clears throat> um, are you more focused on the, the OS X and the laptop desktop side of it? Or have you also looked into iOS? And what are your feelings about the security between the two? I've definitely done both. Um, I've spent more time looking at OS X, so the laptops, uh, computers, stuff like that. Um, you know, Apple did a pretty good job securing the iPhone, iDevices. Uh, you know, basically they just lock down everything. So, um, you know, you do have jailbreaks, uh, but, you know, compared to the OS X side of, of, of their products, um, you know, iOS is really, really locked down. So I'm really not too worried about someone hacking my, my iPhone. Um, at least remotely. Mm-hmm. Um, however, my, do you see my, Apple adopting the uh, iOS platform for their laptops and desktops? I know when they introduced the App Store, everyone kind of freaked sure. out. Uh, do you still see that happening, or do you think they're going to borrow the security mechanisms and maybe implement those on OS X? I think they would like to. Uh, you know, I think there'd be a lot of pushback from users, like, "What do you mean I can't get root on my own my own laptop?" Right. Mm. Um, so I think if that wasn't the case, that they would, and I think we're seeing a push toward it. Um, you know, with like El Capitan, I haven't done a look, a lot of look, looking at that yet, but it seems that more and more we see security components from iOS kind of migrating over into OS X. Um, uh, you so, said, what did you say, El Capitan? What is what is that? It's the next version of, of OS X. Um, oh, okay. So that yeah. uh, so what what's I always go one revision behind. Do you do the same? I tend not to be like one of the first adopters because I find if I am, like nothing works. So it's definitely a trade-off. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting point because Apple, a lot of times, will only patch security vulnerabilities in the latest version. Uh, so, for example, Root Pipe, they patched in Yosemite, but Mavericks, they chose not to patch. So, unfortunately, if you're running Mavericks, um, you're still vulnerable to that local privilege escalation vulnerability. Um, but they, turns out, but they though, put users in that position, Patrick, which is the frustrating thing. If you do... <laughs> Go to the latest versions, then you have to upgrade applications like Keynote, and then I find Keynote is only backward compatible to one revision behind, not two. So if you have older Keynote files, you run into issues like that where they make it hard for people to get to the latest version. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's the it's the trade off usability and security, and unfortunately, with Apple, uh, you know, <laughs> sometimes there's issues with both. Uh, so yeah, it puts users definitely in a predicament. Um, mm. 
Uh, I'm going yeah, to say Go ahead, say Jack. Yeah, welcome you, welcome just, uh, to here on set, and thank yeah, you very much uh, for the, the fabulous uh, cocktail. As, so. as like, the, the last Windows user on the planet, it seems, at times. Uh, Microsoft is doing the same thing now. You know, One of the things that's been a, a reason to stick with Microsoft is uh, that they would uh, work on backwards compatibility, security, was available, but uh, with you know Windows 8, 8.1, 8. and uh, with what's coming in Windows 10, if you want the secure stuff, you get the UI that comes with it, <clears throat> and that's uh, you know it's interesting. I do think that uh, Apple probably watched Microsoft's idea of trying to push everything down the App Store and the Windows uh, 8 RT experiment fiasco, whatever word you want to use, mm-hmm. and <laughs> saw them back back paddle. Uh, very rapidly, and you know now they're they're pushing towards this uh, abstraction layer and, and sort of sandbox whoever else's apps. Um, but of course, Apple has always had a, a much more robust uh, set of apps in uh, their app store. So I don't know, but I think that uh, we're all headed in that direction of trying to keep it on the latest and greatest for security. And mm. if that causes compatibility issues for you, well, then we're really sorry, but screw you. Yeah, that's <laughs> how I feel. I agree. It's how I yeah. feel. Uh, so, uh, Patrick, uh, Microsoft has made huge strides in security of their operating system, and I, I feel very confident in saying that today. That necessarily wasn't I true ten years ago uh, when we started the show, but today I think they've made huge strides from where they were ten years ago. Um, also, I, I look at Windows 10 and some of the security features they have on there, and they seem to be really pushing the envelope, Jack. I don't know how much you've seen of Windows well, yeah, 10. Yeah, I, I ran uh, early builds. I haven't run it in a couple of months, but yeah, they're really trying to lock that down. They're doing, I think, a, a pretty good a pretty good job. They backpedaled on some of the more egregious yeah. horrors of the UI. Mm-hmm. Well, that's um, good. But it's but from a security perspective, from a security it's on perspective, par. they're doing a lot of interesting. Th- if you you know, if you lived in a fantasy land and you ran nothing but Windows 10 desktop, laptop images mm-hmm. and did Active Directory on Azure and let Microsoft run your directory, you'd have a pretty solid system. Now, Interesting. Usability would be, it would be a whole other thing. Yeah. Well, now flip into OS X. How has OS X security first, Patrick, kind of grown over the years? And then how does it compare today to Microsoft's level of security? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think originally OS OS X, um, OS X was arguably more secure than Windows. I mean, it's built on you know BSD, so it's got this like really solid core. Um, unfortunately, I think Apple kind of rested on their laurels with that. Um, and today, I, I agree completely, saying that uh, you know Windows, their anti-exploitation mitigation, the the built-in security features in the in the OS are, in my opinion, way more advanced than Apple. So, for example, Apple says, okay, kernel, kernel drivers, kernel extensions have to be signed. And you're like, all right, that's a good idea. Windows does that. Sounds like a plan. But the way Apple implements it, they implement the checks in user mode, which is absurd because that means an attacker who's trying to load a signed kernel driver or an unsigned kernel driver can just turn off the user mode checks and then load the unsigned kernel extension. Right? Microsoft does it correctly in the kernel checking that. So that's an example to me where Apple kind of gets it. They say, mm-hmm. hey, we should only allow signed kernel extensions, but then their delivery or their implementation um, is flawed. We see this in other areas uh, when they introduced AS- ASLR. They didn't ASLR everything. So obviously as an attacker, if there's regions in a process that aren't randomized, you just target those. So basically ASLR is kind of all or nothing. So basically their implement- implementation was, was broken. So you know, they, they are making strides. I think they continually try to improve, but their improvements seem to be a lot slower than Microsoft's. Um, and a lot of times their implementations end up being uh, trivial to sidestep. So I think... So is it just market share? I mean, obviously there's the whole thing where Macs don't get viruses. <laughs> and I still think there's people who firmly believe that today. And <laughs> really, as we've talked about for the past 10 years on the show, is that it's really easy to put a virus on OS ten, but no one does it because there's not enough market share. Are we still in that place today? Uh, no. I, I think we're, we're definitely trending where marketplace is becoming more common, but also targets of interest to individuals who use Macs also um, exasperate that. So some examples. Um, Tibetan nationalists switched to using Mac computers. Within about six months, we saw some new um, OS ten malware coming out of China that would target those activists. Interesting. Uh, and, and, and even recently, um, Ocean Lotus was um, uh, OSX intrusion, OSX malware that was reported by uh, some Chinese AV companies that were targeting Chinese government entities. So as we see research facilities, 
governments starting to use Macs. I mean, the nation states are obviously going to adapt um, and advance. Um, and one last example, which I think is really interesting, there was a software package called Mac Keeper that a lot of people were using, and there was a vulnerability found in that. Within about three or four days after the proof of concept was published, we saw a new OS X malware that was developed to specifically target that. So then it would go out as a phishing attack, and if the people would click on the links, then they would get infected. So that was a really quick turnaround from a proof of concept exploit that was publicly available to actually brand new OS X malware being released and targeting users. So you know we've seen this in the Windows side of the house, uh, and it's it's just uh, you know the trends are there, and so I think it's only going to get worse for so, Mac users. So Patrick, do you run antivirus software on your Mac? I don't, um, and the re- the reason is I don't either. Uh, don't don't I, feel alone. I do that, on my but. company laptop, you know, to make sure we're compliant. So I gave some talks recently about um, Mac malware, and as part of that, I tried to to write some more sophisticated Mac malware. So what I did was I I wrote some Mac malware that really wasn't that advanced or complex, um, and then I tested it against every known piece of Mac security <laughs> software I could find. So obviously, the antivirus company software is not going to detect it because it's signature based. But I was hoping that products like Little Snitch mm. or other ones that were heuristic based would detect it. And none of them did. So to me, that kind of <laughs> reveals the ineptitude of the, um, the antivirus industry. Now, I'm not saying people shouldn't run it because Little yeah. Snitch will detect and catch most known uh, malware out there. So, um, you know, that's not a bad idea. But the problem is, I, I don't want it to give people a, a false sense of security because any attacker who's even a little bit sophisticated, so obviously any nation state or anyone like that, um, is going to be able to trivially bypass any of these products. I mean, I was able to do it in about an afternoon. So, <laughs> I you know, put a team of hackers together, they're going to just uh, destroy that. Now, you mentioned Little Snitch. Um, what, what do you like about Little Snitch? I, I was running it before. Uh, I'm not running it now. Sure. I'm probably going to put it back on my laptop, but I, I did like Little Snitch. So I like it because it takes a kind of uh, agnostic approach towards malware, right? It just tells you anytime there's a new outgoing connection, and then it's up to you to decide if it's uh, malicious or not. So that's good because even if there's a new malware sample that somehow gets on your machine, uh, you know, a little snitch should at least alert you when it makes that outgoing connection. Um, so that's, that's good. Uh, the problem is, you know, a little snitch, for example, it has an undeletable system rule that says anyone can talk to iCloud. So an attacker could just host... a uh, command and control server on iCloud or use iDrive as a Dropbox and then their malware could just push what exfiltrate any files out to that. And so Little Snitch would, you know, be completely oblivious to that. So there are some shortcomings, but I like that it um, you know, it, it doesn't try to look at malware from like a signature point of view. It just tells you kind of what's going on. So I like tools that do that, that don't try to make decisions for you if things are bad and good, um, but more just tell you, hey, this is going on. Um, you know, and then allow you to kind of make the decision. What, what's your opinion of iCloud? I've been very cautious not to use iCloud because I'm highly skeptical of the security of iCloud in general. I don't really base that in too much fact, but I'm curious to hear what you ha- uh, your opinions are security-wise of iCloud. Um, so I think after the, the fiasco with all the celebrity picks it's, getting yep. uh, hacked, uh, you know, I think Wait, Apple that maybe... that was a fiasco? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, that, that was, was terrible. That was terrible. Horrible. <clears throat> terrible, yeah. Um, but... <laughs> You know, I think they, Apple kind of stepped up their game. I don't know exactly how they compare to other cloud providers. Mm. I don't really use the cloud. I saw a quote this week that was really good. Um, you know, I think you're going to be covering LastPass later in the show. That yeah. The cloud is really just someone else's computer, right? And you're putting a lot of faith <laughs> into them securing it for you. Um, again, it's just a trade-off between usability and security. Um, you know, I don't think there's any inherent flaws to iCloud. I think Apple... Has now you know done taken some good measures to make it more secure, um, but then I think it just still comes down to this question of do you trust Apple or you know any other cloud provider to secure your data? So if you had two Apple computers, a laptop and a desktop, and you wanted to be able to sync files so that you could work on both of them kind of equally, would you use iCloud to sync those? Uh, yeah, I mean I would. I do like the the integration, the usability. You know, Apple makes it really convenient um, to do that. So again, I just think it's the trade-off between security and, and reliability um, and, and security. Uh, you know, and again, if you're handling really sensitive documents, maybe not. But mm-hmm. it, it all comes down to you know what you think is is worth. But now you can encrypt your iCloud storage just as you can encrypt your drive. I believe that's the case. Again, I haven't spent a ton of time with iCloud, yeah. but I think 
And if you're super paranoid, you might be able to, you know, encrypt it locally and then sync it. You'd have to do that manually. But I know some people that, you know, use the cloud for storage mechanisms, but encrypt. have their own encryption. Yeah, no, that's, I say that because I'm kind of toying with going to that kind of computing model. Um, yeah. And I was concerned. I'm like, I don't know if I want to use iCloud. I'm like, but I don't know if I want to use Dropbox either. I'm like, I don't, I don't know if I want to use anything. This is really bad. <laughs> yeah. Sync, is that what it is? That's um, one. Yeah. Uh, I just use Microsoft OneDrive, and then it's 99% accurate. And then the one time you up, update your slide deck 10 minutes before giving a presentation will be the one time it doesn't sync to the device you want. Not that that's happened to me in the past Sounds week like or you anything. Sounds speak from experience, yeah. Jack. <laughs> <laughs> it's stunningly Sucked. reliable, but again, to something, it's something Patrick said, I use it for presentations. So if they leak, then I have more people seeing my presentations, right? I, I don't, yeah. right? Yes. I'm not using it for sensitive stuff. Uh, you know, it's, it's on my iPhone, it's on my Android phone, it's on my laptop, um, and it's handy having them up to date on the phone to review, but it's presentations I plan on delivering, which half the time at least end up on Iron Geek's website. So that's okay. Mm -hmm. I just have to remember not to put unencrypted documents there that matter, right? It's like, oh, here, let me share. No, I'm not sharing my tax returns, right? Right. Right. Besides Las Vegas tax returns, uh, we're a 501c3. You can ask for them and have them. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. It's, it's all about being smart about your data. The problem is you get comfortable with it, exactly. yeah. and then you do something dumb. Not that I would know about that. Uh, but it's like, oh, shit, did I just trust the... Uh, 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 so, uh, Patrick, I'd I feel like... like I ask, I'd like to ask a question. Oh, uh, go ahead, Joff. And, and we may cover this later in the show, but I do want to ask Patrick's opinion. Um, there's, a, there's a paper published, I think it was this week or last week, um, on unauthorized cross-application resource access, uh, OSX and iOS... Uh, where some researchers actually worked out how to bust the keychain, amongst other things, um, due to the uh, ACLs in the uh, in the security model. Um, what's your yep. thoughts on on that? Uh, so I have a bunch of thoughts. So I think some of the things that they did was 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 interesting. The first, again, they were able to get their malicious apps into Apple's, um, you know, the Mac App Store. Uh, so again, this to me, I'm, I've always been kind of skeptical of. Apple's vetting process, um, you know, they say, oh, we vet all the apps that are in the App Store, everything's, you know, secure. So there have been instances in the past where researchers have been able to basically get malicious code into the Mac App Store. So I think people should not blindly trust any apps that they download, even if it's from the Mac App Store. Um, the other issue is, yeah, so the research they did allowed sandbox apps to basically break out of the sandbox. So access uh, keychain data that didn't belong to them, uh, and even access... Um, sensitive information from other third-party apps that obviously a sandbox app should not be able to do. So this is bad. I do like to caveat that with that most Mac software is still downloaded you know, from the internet because there's not a lot of software in the Mac App Store and the software in there is so restrictive. So if you're downloading and running software from the internet, I mean, obviously that software is not going to be sandbox. So it's going to it can be it can access the keychain. It can uh, you know gain access other other information so basically well, well, Patrick to the the exploit was a race condition Correct. Um, my understanding was for the keychain one what they could basically do is they were allowed to delete um, entries mm -hmm. from the keychain that belonged to other apps then register themselves as basically the owner for that and then when the app would go and re-register and store its stuff there, they would basically already own the ACL so that they, they could, could access that. Right, right. The they were preempting the ACL, which is... Yeah. Uh, which I think is, it. It, is an, a neat little attack um, and a very unfortunate vulnerability uh, in, in, in the app. So, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, and, and you, know, you also have to look at Google Project Zero. They've released about 60 or so vulnerabilities that could allow an app to escape the sandbox as well. Um, and these are more like kernel level vulnerabilities or more traditional exploits uh, or you know, um, issues where the most recent research were more lo logic bugs. But again, this shows Apple has the idea we should sandbox things, like that's a good idea from a security point of view, but then their implementation is way lacking. And we see this in pretty much every single security feature they add. Gatekeeper, another one found a really easy way to bypass Gatekeeper, and even if you have it set to only allow code from the Mac App Store, 
you could uh, an attacker could create images that would contain unsigned code that would run and bypass Gatekeeper, um, you know, bypassing their kernel code signing requirements. So again, Apple has these good ideas, but the delivery sometimes falls falls short. Yeah, one of the interesting things I found about the paper was, uh, as I was reading it today, uh, is that the intent-based implementation of Scheme uh, for Android ended up being actually more secure than, than Apple's implementation. So Yeah, that was pretty funny. There's <laughs> a little side comment in the paper, which I thought was amusing too. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah it's, it's, a, it's a good, it's a good little spin because people have, you know, in the in the mobile uh, in the mobile space, people have been saying for a long time, you know, Apple iOS, Apple iOS, and uh, that Android had the dominant share of the the malware. And this paper kind of turned it on its end, which was kind of cool. Uh, the only its- caveat, I think, the keychain attack and the ability for sandbox apps to access other apps data, I think that was only um, that was only OS X or OS X specific. Um, that's true. So that's did, true. Yep. So the paper also did cover some URL scheme hijacking, which has been covered in the past. So there's definitely some areas where iOS security could be, you know, improved. But again, this kind of shows that OS X security a lot of times is a lot more lacking than than, than iOS. Um, but there's going to be issues regardless. Patrick, are there secure configurations that you can have on OS 10 that will help thwart many of these attacks? Like, what's the percentage increase if I really spend some time and I harden my OS 10 system and configuration and kernel, can I, can I thwart a lot of these attacks or is that like not even worth it? That's a great question. I think you can definitely reduce the attack surface. Uh, so, you know, do things like set Gatekeeper to only allow code from the Mac App Store, right? You'd think that'd be a good idea, but well, now there's a vulnerability in Gatekeeper, which mm. is problematic because um, a large majority of the software I looked at that was distributed from legitimate companies over the internet was distributed over HTTP because they assumed that Gatekeeper was going to verify the digital signature and make sure it wasn't tampered in transit. Well, problem is if there's an adversary with network level access, they can obviously manipulate the download. So even I found that too to- several years ago, Patrick, that a lot of um, OS X applications that did auto-updating weren't actually yeah. verifying the updates. Yeah, so I think... And I don't necessarily blame the companies. They understand there's a difference between securing your download and verifying your download. The problem was they basically put all their eggs in one basket and said, hey, Gatekeeper is going to, you know, it's a built-in component of the OS. It's going to verify your download. But uh, if that's broken, then all these other downloads. So that's problematic suspended. because you can, you can secure your system and try to, you know, harden targets, uh, you know, or harden components. But there's going to be zero days, um, mm. you know. So I think it's just a numbers game, and it can't hurt to do those um, you know, most n- no, most known OSX malware we've seen is pretty basic so far. And if you are running a little snitch or you have Gatekeeper turned on, it's going to be thwarted and not even going to be able to install. So I think that's a good thing. Uh, Michael Santarcangelo has joined us. Welcome, Mike. Hello, sir. Um, and uh, not so. Do you and uh, not Kevin? Do you guys have any questions for Patrick? You can you can think about it, and I can come back to you as well. We're talking OS 10 security. Um, Mike, I know you use a Mac. I wasn't sure if you had any questions. You can think about it. I do, you know, the funny thing, I have to give a keynote on this uh, in, uh, in July. So, Patrick, <laughs> I, I'll notes. have more questions. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going yeah, to study this episode time. and come back it. with more questions. Awesome. Uh, it'll, it'll, be, uh, it'll be good. Unfortunately, uh, I don't have any at the moment. That's I'm okay. Uh, Patrick, I wanted to ask you about the enterprise adoption of OS X. I think certainly we've seen that on the upswing. Certainly yep. my own, uh, I'm probably giving away too much information, but in my, my own day job, uh, my entire team is all OS X based, uh, which is nice because we can standardize on applications and, and share things That's with right. each other. If someone joins the group and they have Windows, it tends to throw a wrench in our, our system. Yeah, we're the same way. Yeah. So, but do you see more adoption and what tools are available to enterprises to secure them similarly to the way they secure Windows workstations? Yeah, that's a good question. So I definitely see a lot more adoption. I think, you know, as us younger guys, you know, start getting into the enterprise a little more, um, you know, we bring our Macs, we love our Mac products. Uh, so I think enterprise is, is just going to be kind of like the, one of the final frontiers for Apple that I think they're really trying to push. Um, unfortunately, that's going to increase market share and it's also going to increase, I would say, malware and, and hacks because most... A lot of hackers, especially the nation state ones, you know, are going after corporations and, mm-hmm. and enterprises because that's where the juicy information. You know, look, the U.S. government predominantly uses Windows, but I know, for example, at NASA, a lot of the researchers use Mac. So I think as ad- adoption increases, it's just, uh, you know, the numbers game, you're going to see more, more attacks. 
Um, unfortunately, there's not as much um, security software. So as I mentioned, Mac malware isn't as advanced or mature as Windows malware. The unfortunate reality is uh, security software is not as mature or advanced um, on Mac as well. So I talked to some of the AV guys uh, at RSA and for example, their Windows AV products have heuristics built in, but their Mac products don't. Um, it's basically, mm. they're like, oh, Macs are becoming popular, we should start writing some Mac security software. Whereas, you know, they've been working and honing their Windows software products for 10, 15 years, so they're very mature and, you know, pretty hard for, for malware to get around. On the Mac side of the house, it's, it's pretty, pretty trivial. Um, luckily, most Mac malware is still kind of unsophisticated, um, so, you know, they're, yeah, they're kind of yeah. well. So okay. hopefully, hopefully though, as um, you know, the enterprise starts embracing Macs, um, security software will also hopefully hopefully improve. I think but the, as we see more people go to the cloud, I'm sorry, Jack, I didn't mean to step on you, but I mean, do you see the enterprise adoption of Macs as coming on desktops and laptops, or do you think it's going to be more in terms of tablets and phones and whatever other mobile devices we come up with? I think it'll it'll be both. I'm still. And maybe I'm just really old school. Um, <laughs> you know, I see phones and tablets as kind of like entertainment devices. Mm -hmm. I, you know, when every time I'm I need to do real work, I sit down um, on my, my laptop. And, you know, we saw a trend when tablets came out. Everyone said, you know, that was the death knell for, for PCs and laptops. And then we saw kind of tablets spike and we actually see PC sales kind of picking, picking up. So I think, you know, enterprises are still going to be using desktops and PCs and servers uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, so even though laptop, uh, sorry, tablets and, and iPhones and iDevices will also become prevalent in the enterprise, I think there'll still be a ton of um, OS X products that will be probably what will be targeted because in my opinion, they're a lot easier to hack than say a tablet or a, a phone yeah. running iOS. So then I, I just, I just want to push in that one more round. So when, sure. when we're looking at OS X adoption, do you think it's going to skew more towards laptops and the portable? I mean, I'm, I'm with you because I, I always joke, uh, I can bring my tablet to look at something, but if I want actual work, I got to pull the laptop with me. Or, sure. or do you think that we're going to see them, uh, see Apple dive back into the server marketplace and like actually make a more concerted effort for that? Yeah, um, uh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, they've kind of been, you know, they've had a server line on and off kind of. Um, <laughs> you no, know, I... I think that I would be surprised if they made a huge push into that. I think they're more about the consumer um, and targeting that way. So I think it'll more be laptops, you know, that people can yeah, bring so into the enterprise. But then, yeah. yeah, then they can take home and download stuff from iTunes and watch, you know, stuff on Apple TV. And so I think that will probably. So I think they probably crunched the numbers and been like, you know, we can make a lot more money if we stick to. Uh, you know, doing laptops and, and desktops. So it'll be curious to see then, you know, Paul, when I came in, you, you were asking about Dropbox versus iCloud. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in some of my initial research, I mean, that's, that's where Apple really hasn't done a fantastic job yet is the iCloud. Um, but that's where they're going to have to, they're going to have to make an opportunity come alive there if they want to move into the enterprise space. Yeah, or am the, I misreading it? What was their first attempt, MobileMe? Oh. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Shutter. <laughs> Well, I also think it's, you know, to talk to your point, uh, Mike and, and Patrick elaborate on it as well, is they're very focused on the consumer, where I believe security doesn't rank as high in terms of uh, purchasing decisions. And that could be one of the reasons why Apple hasn't implemented a lot of the more advanced features when it comes to security, because they're targeting the consumer, not the enterprise, yeah. whereas well, Microsoft <laughs> has to answer to the global 2000s right. but, who but are if demanding you were, security. If you were uh, going to sell into a market segment and put thought into it, would you like to sell into a highly commoditized um, market segment with razor thin margins due to competition and the demand from the consumer? Um, or would you like to sell to the end user where you can hold the margin mm -hmm. and um, not have the demands for a decade plus of backwards compatibility that's yes. required in the enterprise? Yes. It's, uh, wow, you know, uh, it's a whole lot. As a business proposition, uh, the idea of selling MacBooks and MacBook Pros and the occasional desktop and then a, a buttload of iOS devices um, <coughs> sounds well, a whole lot well, better. It, it's worth a whole good. lot more profitable 
than <laughs> cranking out uh, Windows 8.1 it, desktops. The numbers support that. I don't know what Microsoft numbers are, but mm-hmm. Apple today is a $900 billion yes, company. Yes. Mm-hmm. $900 billion. What's Microsoft? I, don't know, well, I wonder what the number is for Microsoft has, is, I'm pretty sure, still has, you know, they have a substantially larger user base, but it's not, doesn't have the value. So Apple's right. worse than big oil is what you're saying. You know, what's interesting, didn't <laughs> Tim Cook just come out and, and signal that privacy was going to matter to them now? I wonder if that's actually a signal uh, in that we're we're that's going to be their argument, right? I mean, it, it's interesting because we just talked about all of the security things that we see, uh, and all the opportunities and the ways to bypass it, and maybe they're not as secure as we think, and yet they just came along, and, and they're going to make two factor available in the cloud, or they already have. They're looking at other things, and so you know, Paul, you brought up the point that hey, they're looking at consumers, and, and so therefore, maybe it's not going to be as secure, but they're the ones who came out with Touch ID. They're the first company I've seen that's made biometrics actually palatable. Uh, and to be candid, I'm using it. I, I'm still not sure if I like it, but I'm using it because, my goodness, is it convenient. And so now I'm kind of looking at it going, maybe they're the ones that make a lot of the things that we need in security easier. And if they do... That's a huge opportunity for them. Or am I, again, or do you guys see it differently? Uh, I think, you know, like I said, I, I think Apple would love to lock down the uh, OS 10 as much as iOS for the pure reason is then they can, you know, lock you in, control all the content. Yeah. I think the privacy thing, I think there's a business case to this where they can be like, sorry, we're, you know, you can't get root on your, your laptop anymore because, you know, we want to protect your privacy. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that they have good intentions, but I think there's also a really good business case behind that. So I'm a little skeptical, but I agree. You know, if security that's features point. become more accessible and easier to use for the general public, then, hey, that's an awesome thing. Um, but I think we should be cautious that we don't get a false sense of security um, that, you know, Apple's security, you know, because Apple's security uh, posture and track record is eh, questionable. <laughs> yeah, well, one, you of know, the, one of the challenges of Apple security is they, they are not a very open company. I right? was just going to ask that, Jack. You know, so they're, they're buried. You know, just a, a quick comment on, we've talked about like the, the, the quality of security software for Mac. And if you look at where Android is, you know, Android antivirus <laughs> um, is a bigger joke than, mm. than Mac antivirus. You know, it's uh I haven't seen anything lately, but everything I've seen about most of the the protection software has been, you know, that it's it's farcical. Until you get into, like, the latest hardware that has the latest software on Android and do something like turn on, you know, Samsung's Knox, which beats up performance. Um, Android has is even further behind on the, on that model, and it's... Um, but yeah, well, that's a whole nother disaster that we've covered <laughs> before. But, you know, that there you're at the mercy of your telco, right, of your wireless provider, and they're not known for being merciful. So, you know, there there are things that uh, Apple's getting right on the on particularly on the iOS front. Do we see any play, the, Jack? I was going to ask you this, but Patrick, maybe you know it. I mean, Microsoft has made investments in security. They they ran the trustworthy security group for a while, uh, or computing. They do we see anything like that coming out of Apple or do do we see any opportunities? I mean, because one of the things that we talk about here consistently is, okay, so we're sitting around talking about it. How do we support them? How do we encourage them? How do we help? And Jack, is well, you I mean, they, they had they're folks like, you know, Window Snyder was at Apple for what, five, five mm. years or so. Um, I believe she just announced departure. I don't know where she landed or if she's landed yet. Um, but if somebody like Window sort of disappeared for the years she was at at apple Mm -hmm. and if she weren't making progress i mean i don't know her well but i know her well enough and know her reputation just to pick on window for one if she weren't making progress and feeling like she were making progress she wouldn't have stayed for the years that she did so she was doing something we have no idea what that was Okay. Yep. You know, and and it's no really visibility. frustrating. There's no visibility into it, and so how many things get handled? You know, what are they working on in the background? Um, <clears throat> and it's it is not transparent at all. And that's I kind of get it. My, you know, Microsoft is public about a lot of things, and they've had people abuse advanced information. They've had them do a variety of things. I think Apple is a is a little bit overly uh, tight with information. Yeah. To, Put it mildly. Mm-hmm. I think okay. that's a that's a great question because um, 
you know, I've, I've dealt with the security team because I've reported several vulnerabilities. Um, and the people they have working in the security team are awesome, like really bright guys. Um, but it seems that Apple proper maybe doesn't have quite as much of a um, cultural philosophy that respects security. So you go to Microsoft and, you know, they, the security is like foundational, right? Like developers are on board, you know, and it's like they have the, um, you know, just a lot of security basically built in. Apple, it seems more of that. Security almost takes a, a back seat, um, and yeah, they're super. You know, it's it's frustrating because they're they're not transparent at all. Um, so, you know, until I think two or three years ago, they had a quote on their website saying that um, you know Apple's Apple on an OS ten is immune to Windows based viruses, which is technically true, but that's almost saying that Macs are immune to viruses. So I also wonder how much hmm. Mac wants to pervade or continue to try to. Get people to think that you know everything is secure. Where the you know they'll put their head in the sand, or you know just ignore it till it goes away. It's obviously not really costing them that much money, right? They're the most profitable, most valuable company in the history of, of the world, almost. Um, so you know that could be part of the explanation as well. Mm-hmm. You know, to answer the earlier question, uh, Microsoft is a three hundred seventy billion dollar company, um, but uh, in terms of profitability, so you know you're talking about half, but the or a little little less than half but the uh the interesting thing will be where apple evolves to i think when when they are forced with the decision to take security seriously which they will be sooner or later if the market share keeps growing like this and the attacks keep growing um and whether they choose to take more of the commoditized approach and kind of avoid the issue or whether they're actually going to take the enterprise seriously uh, i think that's going to be an interesting question uh, coming yeah, up. but see, I mean, again, I, I'm just going to look at it and say, I, I think that they're signaling that they will. I mean, you, we're all old enough on this to remember when uh, IBM well, you're, came you're out old. with the thumb readers. I'm old, uh, <laughs> right? Remember <laughs> Compact, when Compact had their their little handheld devices and you could run your thumb along it, and that stuff was really nifty, never adopted. It was horrible. It didn't work well. But the Touch ID works. Like, I think the thing is, we're looking at it saying they're not as transparent as we're like, and it's not necessarily... I don't want to say enterprise grade. My read on it is it's not really set up for enterprise manageability. That doesn't mean that it's not there. But where we'd like to see more openness and transparency is what are they prioritizing? What are they fixing? How quickly are they handling it? And and we we don't have any of that. We got Zippy. Well, yeah, the, so Joff, it was um, the valuation of Apple is seven hundred billion, and the reason I know that is because I was reading about Ronald Wayne, who owned ten percent of Apple stock, oh, yeah. uh, uh, and sold it, uh, and today it would be <gasps> worth approximately sixty billion dollars, and I think he sold it for fifteen hundred dollars or something. I like thought that. the comment was was nine hundred billion, but you yeah, know, I, I, I was a billion off, here, a billion there. Yeah, what's a couple hundred billion when we're talking about that much, Joff? You're like a Rockefeller now, huh? Yeah. So I will agree. I think Apple has good security intentions and I think they are driving a lot of, uh, you know, maybe security research, um, you know, but their track record with their issues with implementation, uh, you know, I think it takes them a few tries to get it right, but then when they do get it right, yes, you know, then there's uh, security that's more available and useful, usable to, to users. So I think the end result is good. Just getting there, they also have a few few stumbles. What, what I find interesting with, with the cloud paradigm is that Microsoft's taken the long road on that. I mean, they have basically lifted up their Active Directory stuff and they pushed it all towards the cloud. It's a pretty intuitive, not intuitive, that's a, that's a, pretty, uh, a pretty smart move. I mean, th- they have taken a, a longer road to get there, but the potential reward for them is, I think, is pretty large. Um, whereas, you know, Apple's sitting in this, this position of, of sort of starting to dabbleize in the, dabble in the enterprise space. Uh, I just think I just created a word, dabbleize. Anyway, um, dabbling in the enterprise space, and, and that's, um, that's a way different spot that, that, than where Microsoft's coming from. So it, it'll be interesting to see how it, how it plays out. Uh, in the, the, long run. the Microsoft Cloud story is, is about ease of adoption. In, in many ways, um, it is opposite the Amazon... And to a certain extent, Rackspace and, and the rest of the crowd model. You know, Amazon, if you want to get the most out of Amazon, you re-architect everything and take advantage of all the power that it offers. You re-architect everything, you containerize everything. And, you know, Microsoft is saying, you want to go that way, that's cool. But why don't we just put Active Directory in Azure and you just sign up for a slice of that. And everything that you're used to, we'll just handle all of that for you. But better, and uh, 
You know, That's so a they have compelling a very, story, though. Right, it, it is. It doesn't give you the power of, you know, a completely re-architected environment, you know, the stuff that the Securosis guys are um, always talking about and really are masters of. Uh, but that's such a daunting task for people that the Azure model works. And, you know, what what claim does um, does Apple take to, to that enterprise? You know, they don't have management tools and they don't have that, that path to the cloud to manage it. Um, but on the other hand, they seem to be doing okay in spite of anything we might complain about. They seem to be doing okay. I don't know that they um, need our advice. Well, I mean, the, I the, lin the linchpin is going to be that market share question. As it starts to turn over, as, as, as we start getting targeted as OSX users, particularly iOS uh, included, it, that, that could flip on, the, on its head very, very quickly. Do, do you think it's uh, market share? Because right now I think that, uh, thankfully, uh, a lot of criminals aren't that bright. Because if you, again, putting some economic thought into it, uh, there's the value of the target, right? Who, mm -hmm. who do you want to target? Uh, you know, what are you doing? If you, if you want to build a, a botnet, sure, go after the Windows machines. If you're going to launch a, a phishing campaign for... Uh, financial fraud, do you want to target uh, people still running Windows 7, or do you want to target people that uh, have a Mac? Um, I know which one I would expect to have a higher return. Mm -hmm. well, we're seeing it already. I mean, we're seeing Mac malware coming out as exploits being released. We're seeing you know, <laughs> malware using those exploits within right. weeks now. So um, I, I agree. I, you know, I think criminals are wising up that depending on who they're targeting and that Mac users are sometimes, um, you know, the CEOs or the R&D heads, you know, those kind of stuff that, you know, there's a lot of good stuff there. Well, there's a, there's a development cycle too. I think mean, the, the other point that I'd, I'd like to make is that, you know, the, the uh, for better or worse, the Windows malware market has got a long development cycle behind it. And so the, the ability to produce malware is, is very, uh, very expeditious, very quick. Um, that 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 base level of code has got to build up in the Apple side first before we start seeing things hit very quickly. Yeah, but you I know, I, there yet. I guess so. I looked it up. So uh, so in Q one of this year, uh, Apple's market share um, of laptop devices um, is twelve percent, which represents an eight point nine percent growth year over year. So that's you know I mean it's that's actually sizable I mean compared to HP and Dell combined no it's not not the greater bit but you know the, the other thing I keep sitting here thinking about is but we're pushing more people to just collectively the cloud I don't care what that means beyond it's on somebody else's computer however you want to look at it, it's fine and so the model that says hey Mac can just start locking their stuff down tighter because more and more you're going to access resources someplace else. I mean, look, I, I'm using Google Docs and stuff all the time. I love it. it the convenience sure. of it is fantastic. So we're getting to that point, Jeff, where the amount of sophisticated malware you're going to need to do it m might might decrease. Save one thing. The fact now that, like, if my phone rings, it rings on every freaking device that I own. Is um, it, That sounds nifty until you deal with it, and you're like, yeah, okay, I don't like this. But that means there's a lot of weird places for code to hide. So maybe I've just count, contradicted myself. But I, I think that we're at an interesting confluence of events, and um, I think if we as an industry get it right, we're going to make sizable gains that we haven't been able to make for 20 to 25 years. But the trade-off to that is going to be some more narrow pathways for people to travel. And I don't, I don't think it's a bad thing. I just well, think it's something that's going to take time. The client side still matters, right? I mean, the action's all in the browsers, as you just pointed out, right? Everything's moving cloud side. Browsers be be becoming incredibly important. Um, the browser is, in, in many ways, becoming the operating system. Uh, and so, you know, the client side matters, uh, I think, less and less at the operating system layer and more and more at the application layer. Yeah, uh, okay. Because, I buy that. Because, because yeah, of but my, my laptop has to look cooler than everyone else's, and I think that's going to drive people <laughs> towards. Yeah. I, I like the way that you. Is that why you, you have the bedazzled laptop? You seductively rubbed it when you said I that. I did. I, did, I rubbed it. You, <laughs> you know, Paul, all kidding aside, that, that actually kind of brings up an interesting point in that uh, we're talking about security for Microsoft versus Apple. Apple has been a PR machine from mm. the beginning. That's what's made yeah. them that company. It's all PR. And at the beginning of the segment, we opened with the joke of, you know, you can't get a virus on OS X. It's not possible. 
People actually think that because it's great PR. Mm -hmm. So you, Apple doesn't have the, the, the court of public shame that Microsoft does, that reputation of, oh, man, you're totally open to all those viruses, cause, but I have a Mac, so it's okay. They have no incentive to really drive security on a rapid basis. So I'm not surprised they keep it so closed source and so slow because it's the user experience and the PR that matters to their bottom line. Well, Microsoft, doesn't matter what happens to them, are going to be hung out to dry. Mm. Hey, guys, so what's that, the that average refresh that, rate that today? Won't change, though. That doesn't mm. mean that won't change. No, 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 no. As, as soon as we start seeing more OSX adoption in the enterprise, that I'm not surprised we're going to see because they have no incentive. It's like, it's like going for, to, to management for security budget. It's just they, if they don't care about it, they're not going to give you any money. Apple doesn't have to care about it because of a great PR team that tells their users that their laptops are going to be convenient and secure no matter what. No worry. That's there why are, they sell so well. There are no security vulnerabilities here. Yeah, I mean, so yes. from a business perspective, you know, maybe, maybe they, you know, speculatively, maybe they duck the enterprise. I mean, literally duck it and avoid it. I mean, they, they tried in the enterprise, and it, you, you don't hear about the Apple's equivalent of Act Directory. Mm. It, right, yeah. No. Pa Patrick, <laughs> I, um, I have five closing questions for you. Woohoo! Awesome. Uh, are you ready? I am ready. All righty. Three words to describe yourself. Passionate surfer. <laughs> that's Wait, only that two, two. That's two. That's okay. A passionate surfer. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Malware. <laughs> if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? I've drank the apple juice. In the popular game of Ass Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? I would say first. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Hmm. Um, I would say Jessica Alba and Anjali Jolie. <laughs> oh, yes! Yes, we got that in there. Have you watched the show before? It's the most popular answer, Patrick. No, I haven't. It is. I don't know. She's just a very motherly figure, apparently. And that was marriage equality, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, that, yeah, it's, it's very metro of you. I, that's uh, all right. Well, Patrick, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. Thank you. And can I have a, like, one shameless oh, plug? Yes, please so. do. I, I did not give you the opportunity to do a shameless plug. You have that opportunity now. Uh, so I have, an, I have a personal website where I basically share the Mac security tools that I write to secure my computer. So I realize that security on Macs is kind of lacking. So I try to basically write tools and then share them completely free, no strings attached, um, for people to download. Um, so that's kind of like hoping to, to help, the, help the problem. Um, so the security website for that is ObjectiveC.com, C as in like C with your eye. Um, SEE, um, and there's a hyphen between objective and C. Yeah, there's a um, link to that in our in our show notes as well. Perfect. People can find it. Um, and also, you know, Synac, we do crowdsource vulnerability discovery really well. So, uh, you know, enterprise, uh, you know, definitely definitely a good way to kind of uh, vet your security uh, of your system um, in a in a in a model that simulates kind of what the real world hackers are are, are doing for you. So. That's my, my, my sales pitch. Uh, thanks again for having me on the show. Awesome. Really good chat. And hopefully see you guys um, in Vegas. I'm talking at Black Hat on how to write good Mac malware. Nice. <laughs> and, and I'm talking at DEF CON on um, DLL or Dilib hijacking on OSX and then giving another talk on um, XPC and the rootkit vulnerability that Apple tried to patch and, and fail. So Excellent. That's the plug there. Well, so, we'll thanks again, guys. Thanks, really Patrick. See you in Vegas. Take care. All right. Aloha. Take care. With that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and talk about our stories for this week. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Uh -huh.